offer your products and your services for free while funding it behind the scenes with highly targeted advertising. Now, the irony is that this ultra-capitalist model requires that the web stay true to its non-capitalist roots. It has to remain an open network, easy to search, with no pay-per-view and no areas that Google can't go. This open vision of the web also requires us users to play our part, consuming the eye candy in a virtual sweet shop of free content. The longer we're online, the more attention we pay, the more information businesses of all kinds can capture, and the more advertising they can sell. The product online is not the content. The product online is you. The product online are the eyeballs looking at that content, and as much information about how to influence the hands connected to those eyeballs as possible. But if trading information on web users is the driving principle behind a free web, then where do you stop? Where does the boundary lie between our rights and the search for profits? Today, we are experiencing surveillance that we could never have imagined 20 years ago. Here's one example amongst many, Google's email system. Every time you send a Gmail, it automatically scans the text inside to find keywords that might reveal what it's about. So if you write the word beach in your message, then ads down the side of the page might be about holidays. Or if you write about your pet, then you might get ads for pet accessories, medicine, dog walkers. If you're arranging to go out on the town with friends, ads for the local hotspots might show up. Or recipes for weight loss, then you'll get ads for healthy food or dieting courses. The email service you're getting is free, but Google's computers are listening in on the contents of your email and matching them with advertising that they think might be relevant to you. That is the price that you pay. Google points out that all free webmail services scan email and that Gmail respects privacy because content is not revealed to outside parties. On their website, they say, we let you know what information we collect when you use our products and services, why we collect it, and how we use it to improve your experience. But this isn't just about Google and email. Online advertising goes further still. Advertisers are eager to know about our activity right across the web. And so to better understand what we want, they're tracking our browsing habits. It's called behavioral targeting. Think of it like going on a shopping spree and accumulating lots of bags. When you buy something, you become laden with bags. The branding on the bags quickly gives away to onlookers where you've been and what types of things you've been buying and what you're likely to buy in the future. All of which is very valuable to advertisers. This is how the online version of that works. When we visit a site that contains advertising, the advertising company's server sends back at us a cookie, a tiny file that identifies our computer uniquely. Now, as we surf the web, the cookie, in effect, tracks where we go, registering our interests with the advertising company. They then target adverts more accurately. Visit a car site, get car ads. Visit a travel site, get travel ads. It's that simple, yet also for many, deeply worrying. By monitoring somebody's web behavior, you can build up a picture of who they're talking to, what they're reading, what they consume, and that can be an incredibly intimate uh, and, and, and potentially powerful profile of somebody's life. Many of these judgments can only be quite poorly made out because they don't know the context you're in. So if I'm looking up 
somebody's looking up material on um, cancer. Uh, is that for me? Is that for a friend? Is it for a piece of coursework? And, of course, real decisions can follow from that. I'm really not so vexed by behavioural uh, advertising and, and targeting. I think that as long as it's transparent at some level and the, you, the consumer or the user, have the ability to find out what is being kind of used to your benefit, your supposed benefit, then I feel quite relaxed about it and actually think that it can be an exciting leap forward. So, we've seen that we pay for web search through being targeted with advertising. We pay for some email systems by having our emails scanned for advertising opportunity. And we pay for browsing sites by being tracked through cookies. Consumers are becoming the consumed. We are watched and traded. If this wasn't enough, web commerce seems to be evolving one step further and perhaps in a more troubling direction. It's attempting to bury itself deeper in our minds to try to shape what it is that we want before we even know that we want it. And this is where the old dot-coms come back into our story. Like Google, Today, many online retailers have got clever in collecting and analyzing information on their customers. We study your past purchase history and then use that in a statistical way to make predictions about what other things in this massive catalog of products that you might be interested in. What Jeff Bezos is talking about is a whole new level of interaction with customers and something that's defining the new commercialized web recommendation engines. As you start looking for cameras, you start to see people who clicked, who, who looked at this also looked at that. People who bought this, people who clicked at this bought that. Um, you know, in, this, in the course of your clicking, the service becomes more useful to you. One way to think about that is we're sort of redecorating the store for each customer who walks in. If you think about a physical store, that would be impossible. You can't uh, run around and rearrange the furniture and put the products that that particular individual customer might like most up front. Very, very difficult. But in an online store, of course, you can do that. You can redecorate the store for each individual customer. You can help people find things that they might not have ever been able to find any other way. Recommendation engines enable businesses to constantly personalize their offerings to match our interests and behavior. This intimate knowledge of customers gives web companies a head start in competition with real-world retailers. One of the best examples is how it's helping Netflix, an entirely web-based film rental company, to rival the bricks and mortar giant Blockbuster. We look at movies as a really rich area to try to understand human behavior and how to create a better experience than um, any other video system so that people watch more and more movies. Fundamental to their business is a computer algorithm called Cinematch that uses customers' preferences to identify other DVDs that they might like. Movie taste is very personalized, but what we realized is if we ask people to tell us what other movies they've loved in the past, that our computer systems can do a really good job of helping them choose movies that they're more likely to enjoy in the future. Netflix now has over 12 million subscribers and a turnover of one and a half billion dollars per year. Millions of people obviously enjoy these recommendation systems and are happy with what they get in return. But I worry that in the process, perhaps we've lost something. I wonder if recommendation systems don't defeat the point of the web. Isn't the vast possibility that the web offers for serendipity to bring us unexpected new ideas from accidental encounters, being replaced by a process that apparently broadens our horizons, but actually sells us the same things? Amazon, because we carry universal selection, really uh, dehomogenizes culture. It lets uh, people uh, pick the products that they want. You get to read the books that you want, not just the books that were cherry-picked and hand-selected to fit into a store of a certain size. But just because the web now enables us to choose from a vast selection, that doesn't mean we actually take up the opportunity. Faced with overwhelming choice, 
consumers to 